on who's worked for FEMA. So if anything, you know you're going to get the real story. I can't make anything up here. Um, so what I want to be able to do is, uh, you know, Hans has asked me to, to speak a little bit about uh, the Oso landslide, uh, about Cascadia rising. Uh, but on your topic, you probably heard this already from quite a few people. Uh, with Oso, it was a very serious scenario, uh, situation that took place. But the truth is, the federal government didn't have a massive role. Uh, and I'll explain here a little bit why the conditions of that existed. And for Cascadia, uh, if you look at that, really, there's so many assumptions and there's so many artificialities that we had to add from an exercise design perspective that the people who were making the decisions and whether it's pushing paper, uh, trying to get resources going, they are not in the same mindset as you would see uh, somebody who is actually in this disaster uh, environment. So um, I've been on a number of disasters over the last 11 years or so that I've been with FEMA. Um, 20 years federal service, uh, four of those including as an infantryman for the U.S. Army. When you look at the disaster piece, I've seen the, the hurricane uh, deployments, whether it's in the Texas or Florida. Um, I was activated for the OSO um, uh, incident, uh, working out of our emergencies operations center. Uh, was at Sandy for, for two months, working there in downtown Brooklyn with four million people right there, high density uh, population, major impacts to that community, um, as well as just returning and spending three months away, uh, a little bit in Texas, a little bit in Florida, and also Puerto Rico. So part of what I take it is my mission and my job is being able to share that dialogue uh, and this is a two-way conversation for me. So at any point along the way, um, you're not going to see a lot of words on the screen, but you're going to see some visuals, you'll hear the dialogue, uh, and I kind of talk fast. I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. So anytime you see something, you got a question, be happy to clarify, but I might also ask you just to hold that because I've got it probably coming up in the slide deck. Um, so to get started, I know Hans has asked you. It's always something. All right. All right, so it's changing there. All right, uh, so I know that you all have been asked to take some independent study courses to kind of understand how, how the, the system works for emergency response. Um, here's a great visual because it really illustrates here where the incident could, it, where it occurs and the roles and responsibilities of what has to happen before the federal government ever comes into play. And so there's kind of a line right here, and that is from the incident locals and the state becoming involved to the point that, hey, the state no longer has the capability or they have a capability gap, and now we need federal assistance to bring in those resources. So that can be a lengthy process at times. Sometimes it's much quicker. Uh, but because, you know, whether it's a home rule state or Dillon rule, uh, here at with home, the expectation is, is in our backyard that those local communities are prepared and ready to take care of themselves when a disaster strikes and that the state is going to be in that support role, but they can easily take over if, if necessary. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea how the response uh, and resource flow and requests that come in, it's a pretty big machine, okay? And when I throw this, why I throw this up here related to the National Response Framework is to show you that this giant monster up here, the Joint Field Office, it takes a long time to get one of those built typically, and that's where the feds and the state come together to help work those capability gaps. But the true business end of what happens here is down with the locals. This is, your, whether it's your emergency services, um, your local uh, county officials, uh, mayors, all that happens there. And then that state in the middle is trying to negotiate that process of federal resources and getting them where they need to be. And this is a little bit of a, a diagram that shows you, this is how we are gonna formulate, all right? Basic ICS NIMS uh, structure on how the state and the feds come together. A uh, lot of parties at play here, but one of the things that we need during a disaster is trying to come up with some joint objectives and priorities so that we can focus efforts and determine what is it that really needs to be taken and happen in a phased approach. This is for Puerto Rico. Uh, this gives you an idea of how many players are in the room. This is just the Unified Coordination Group, which is a reflection of this slide. Ideally, what you've got here is you've got uh, you got a state coordinating officer, you got a federal coordinating officer, you've got uh, the Department of Defense that's at the table, large number of people with resources, but you just can't launch them downrange. Now where FEMA comes into play is once the state puts in a request and says, hey, I have a capability need, FEMA's gonna figure out how's the best way to resource that. FEMA's the only agency that has the authority to go and task assign or mission assign another federal agency. So if we need somebody to go inspect a dam, Army Corps of Engineers, we need you to go handle this, right? 
they're going to get reimbursed, likely under the under a declaration and the, and the funding that is provided for that. Uh, but the federal government has a ton of resources. FEMA is that focal point to try to do that coordination. This is what a joint field office looks like. Uh, this one here, this was set up about uh, three weeks after the hurricane rolled in. And what you're seeing there is mostly feds, but there are some territorial, or th normally these would be state employees in there working. But for the most part, these are federal employees representing all federal agencies trying to coordinate and get those resources where they need to be. You can only imagine from an information sharing standpoint what type of a mess that is. For every one person that you see in this room, I promise you there's probably anywhere from 100 to 10,000 people out in the field that are feeding these individuals information across email, web EOC, uh, telephone, you name it. Uh, but this is normally a very intense scenario environment. It's not uncommon to see people yelling at each other, getting upset. Why? Because people feel that there's individuals out there who need to have attention paid to them. Uh, the survivors need to get resources, and sometimes those long hours, 12, 14, 16 hours, they add up. And it, it is, it's pretty stressful. But for the federal government, this is what typically you're going to see for a response. It's called, what was the yellow line there? Oh, that's tape. Uh, that's no. like IT wires oh, okay. and, and stuff like that, tripping hazards. So Cascadia Rising. Um, Large amount of people that participated in that. I think the final number was about 23,000. Great. That's exactly what I would like to see from a preparedness standpoint. Uh, but I will tell you that when we start talking about catastrophic disasters, it's well beyond 23,000 people. Um, the scale and scope, I'm not, trying to, I don't, I'm not trying to scare anybody in this process, but the scale and scope of how many folks are really involved with a catastrophic or even a moderate-sized disaster uh, is pretty overwhelming. Uh, so I just want you to be able to take that into, into context. A couple of the findings from the after actions uh, related to situa situational assessment. You know, I almost feel like this slide or, or the findings that we put in the AER, the only reason we put it in there is because we needed to have something for best practices. Hey, this is something that we need to do. Truth is, people were able to log into the systems. Um, it's not that they were, uh, they were able to, to coordinate amongst different EOCs or not, but hey, people could log in and they could navigate the platform relatively okay, right? There's not a, major, there's not a ton of major ones here, um, in my opinion. Now, the improvements here is pretty much as you would expect. So, uh, when you want information in a disaster environment, you don't want everything. And this is the hardest part, is that in a technology age uh, that we're in right now, it's so easy for anybody to send a message. And it does not matter whether there's any value in the content or not. But it is something as a human being, now you have to take time, whether it's five seconds, a minute, to analyze, digest, and where is it going to go next. Uh, so when we look at essential elements, elements of information, we want information that is going to focus on the priorities at large uh, on a disaster. Early on, it's going to be about life safety. How are we going to save people's lives? Whether it's pulling them out of the rubble, uh, whether it's getting them food and water, but there's all this other stuff that happens that comes in through email. And I will tell you that people are not reserved in sending emails. Uh, it's not uncommon to be on a disaster like this and uh, you get hit with uh, 300 emails in, I don't know, just a couple of hours. It's a lot to sift through. And then, of course, I've got to forward it on a distro list, right? I can't hold that information myself. I can't let the information die there. It's a bit of a train wreck. Um, and then we talk a little bit, I think, later about the systems and, and what worked and what didn't. This kind of goes back into the interoperability. Uh, there's a couple of different platforms that out there that exist in emergency management. Um, some work okay, uh, but I will tell you that uh, I, I rarely see when you're in the early stages of a, of a response, people using these platforms. Of course there's people using them, but there's no way to really use them effectively. One thing you cannot get back in a disaster is time. And to go in, log into these sites, try to sift through data, the feeling is psychologically that somebody's life is on the line or somebody is in peril. How do you get beyond that? I don't know. Um, there are some recommendations that I think that we, as a country or a profession, we've got to be able to figure out and how do we get there. So my perspective is going to be a little bit different than anybody else that you've, uh, you've had talk to you so far. 99% um, of the FEMA employees that you're going to run into and, and talk to uh, in any of the regions, their experience is going to be from the joint field office. That big room, with anywhere in, in Hurricane Sandy, the one that we had in New York was 5,000 people, 5,000 feds in that, in that facility. 
Uh, my perspective is, is I'm a field employee. So what happens is I go out in the capacity, whether as a branch director or a division supervisor, but I am the one who works directly with the mayors, the county officials, the executives, judges, you name it, uh, public works officials, to try to be that barrier to getting resources and getting information to where it needs to go. So in my experiences, I've worked in the JFO before. Um, they're, they're fun, they can be fun uh, in a weird way. But, reality, but the, the truth is, is that my experience coming to you is I've seen all this hands-on. These photos that you're going to see, the videos, uh, they're from first-hand experience of trying to work and negotiate through these problems that you are going to be able to see or you would face as an emergency management official or somebody who, if you're trying to solve these problems through helping to build platforms and methodology and, and algorithms, great. This is, a, this is the reality that you're going to face. It may not look like Cascadia as the exercise. Different from the disaster, but the exercise, you didn't see a lot of the tensions that, uh, and complications that you would see in the real world. Uh, so uh, Florida here, as you can, excuse me, Texas, uh, I had this portion down here, I highlighted it, but pretty decent portion of uh, five counties. What folks don't know is that for these catastrophics, every one of these counties is going to be assigned a FEMA employee. That's very rare. Uh, that's only reserved for the catastrophics. Uh, state and locals, they're not prepared for that. They're not ready for a FEMA employee to come and parachute in and to help manage operations on the ground and do that FEMA coordination. Uh, in, in Texas, I had the luxury of spending my first five days in Houston. That was crazy. It was eye-opening. And I'll show you some of the uh, examples here of, of just the volume of whether it's a scenario or information overload. Um, the complexities to overcome this stuff is enormous. So I spent this time here, I had, uh, I had here in the middle, branch three, and, and this is how we break this up over geography, right? So we get branch directors to manage each one of these branches, um, and then each one of these uh, local communities here are going to get what's called the division supervisor. And uh, really, again, it goes back to trying to break down those barriers and walls to, to getting federal response. Uh, during this period of time in Puerto Rico, I had the branch one, which is that whole western section. Now, a lot of the attention that you're going to see that was happening in the media happened right here in Branch 3 in San Juan. Uh, normally, this commute should be able to take me about uh, two hours because the power was out, no traffic lights, just general chaos ruled the day on the roads. Uh, this is easily a six-hour ordeal. Perspective. Uh, this is Puerto Rico. This is out here in Zone 1. Uh, as you can see, though we have a small generator running the TV, Nobody has laptops. Nobody has cell phones. Uh, pop, rolling power outages complicated what we were dealing with. This is the scenario that we're facing here, whether it's Cascadia Rising, could be related to some of the volcano activity that we've got here, Lahars, uh, coast uh, tsunamis. This is, this is a real thing. People were not prepared to get rid of their computers and their, their cell phones and try to manage on paper. People did not have forms ready. It just was not something, it was not a line of thinking that people were prepared for. Well, this is the hard part with electricity. It's become so reliable. Uh, you know, a lot of these utilities are claiming 99% uh, reliability rates. The truth is the infrastructure is aging. So what you're seeing in Puerto Rico, yes, it's different than what we have in the U.S., but it's the same conditions that we're facing now. Uh, infrastructure, you know, it's, it's, it's costly. Um, and we just continue to expand our populations across our communities. And there are some vulnerabilities. It doesn't matter if it's a geomagnetic storm. Geomagnetic storm could take out the, a grid. Um, it could just be equipment failure. We saw this in 2003 in the blackout in the Northeast. This stuff happens. Thank goodness it's only been for limited hours. There's cases with the Bonneville Power Administration, energy in our backyard, where multiple substations could go down and we could be without power for two years. The reason is those very unique unicorns, those transformers, take two years to build and to get them shipped here. They weigh 850,000 pounds. Oh, I'm not asking yeah. why. I'm asking why the people weren't expecting that the power would go down. I would say most people in, our, in the United States aren't prepared or, or ready for a power outage. In fact, if you look at any of the power outages, we had one in Seattle, the city of Seattle happened last year. It was a one hour power outage and people lit up social media complaining about how crazy this was that the city of Seattle could lose power. Um, <laughs> it, it's just, what do you do? Yeah, sorry, are you saying like population as a whole? I'm not talking about population. I'm talking about the FEMA people. The FEMA. 
Yeah, or the word emergency management people weren't expecting the power. This guy, I'll get into it. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Okay, so here's Harvey. Uh, with Harvey, as you can see, this the there was a lot of data out there that says that the word water showed up should have never happened. But again, some of this isn't a perfect science. Um, what I was a little bit uh, hopeful for being down there in, in the Houston area was that two weeks in, there were still people trapped in their homes, right? We did not find, and I say we, the profession, the whole community at large, we did not find an effective way to tell people, hey, one, to be better prepared, or two, you really need to evacuate. You need to get the heck out of Dodge. This is the time to go. So what you saw here is that two weeks in, people realized, hey, help's not coming. This is the local community being able to share information amongst themselves and build and execute their own uh, uh, rescue plan. And so everyone you see on there, those are local community <coughs> members from across Texas that, that had brought boats in to save locals and figure that out. So the federal government is not coming for you. They're not coming to save you at the first time that the earthquake happens or an immediate uh, aftermath of a disaster. The state doesn't have that capability. It's going to be these communities that have to be reliant on one another. Another example is you got Google Maps here. Uh, it took me almost five hours just to get into Houston because Houston was an island. And none of the information sources that I had available to me, like Google Maps, was accurate. Go down one street, and I don't want to say I was risking my life, but some of this stuff was pretty, pretty uh, treacherous trying to drive through it. And just to try to navigate and find a way into Houston was problematic. So this is the information that you think, and I, and I took screenshots of this stuff. Boom, hey, this is what I got. It says this road's open. Clearly it's not. The communication systems that we had in place just simply could not keep up. Examples that we're going to see across, this is a school. Every school I came across had a shelter in it. Why? Because people needed a place to go. They had no power. They had no food. They needed a place to go, and they went to the local community centers. So our communities are not immune from this. This is Texas, modern-day Texas. So these schools you have in your backyard, where in your communities do you think people are going to roll to? Nobody necessarily told them to go to the schools. They just know where people congregate and where there might be resources. This is where they ended up. you got people living outside underneath the shelter because the, the inside of the gymnasium is packed. Feeding. There was no supply channels to feed folks. There just wasn't. So the community had to find resources within and try, then try to find ways to be able to refrigerate this stuff. And then when I thought I saw it all in some of these small-scale uh, shelters, now, just think of how much information. If you were an emergency manager or a first responder, think about the amount of information you need to deal with this. And there's only 200 people in there. You've got kids, you've got elderly, you've got access and functional needs, you've got people who are renters, you've got people who have homes, you've got people who have cars, no cars, pets. In order for an emergency management organization to respond to this, they have to have a clear picture of what the numbers are. How do you communicate that stuff if you don't have power and you don't have cell phones? You don't have access to data. This is uh, the convention center in, uh, in Houston, one of two of them. Uh, the first night I was there, I got a call, said, hey, we need you to get, you, get down to the convention center right now. I showed up, it was me, and there was four other FEMA people there. And the four FEMA people were there really wasn't, they weren't sure what to do. Uh, so being a senior leader of the agency, hey, look, this is what we're going to do. We, we need to start sizing up what this, what this deal is here. Uh, the governor at the time said, no more than 4,000 people in this convention center. The reason why, everybody knew it, even though it wasn't spoken, we didn't want this to turn into a Katrina. 4,000 people, that's it, cut it off. Uh, that night, there was over 8,000 people already inside the building. The next morning, it had risen to 13,000 people. What you see there, right there, is just one bay of six. And that's me from up on top uh, being able to try to take, take it down. But you can see there's a mixture. There's the access and functional needs issues that were here, majorly, majorly difficult to deal with. Uh, it's not just one-on-one. -on -one. It's not one emergency responder to one person who has a, 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 a disability or a special need. Sometimes it takes three or four people to be able to work towards that one uh, situation. So here's a quick video I just want to show you. Um, this video was, this is about day four. This to me was already starting to unfold Katrina. It's the exact thing, same thing that you saw where the helicopter was up above filming down and you could see people out on the streets, there was panic. We were starting to get to this point and you should ask all of yourselves this, 
How long can you and your family spend in a shelter where the lights are on 24-7, you've got 13,000 closest friends all sharing the same bathroom. How many sleeps can you have in that facility before you snap? So day four, things are starting, the tension's starting to rise a little bit. What is happening? I could not get people to listen to what we were dealing with there in Houston at that convention center. The reason is, is they had all this other noise going on coming in. There was no real solid stream of information that would show them this was the problem. So what did I do? I fired up this video and I let them see for themselves firsthand what it was that they were doing, that we were dealing with here. I don't know if you can hear the dogs barking. There's a special bay just for dogs. This was one of the, the less, less dense uh, of the pods. But you'll see me turn the corner and then they just keep going forever. Scott, what day was this? Like day two, day four? Uh, this is day four. This is 13,000 people crammed in there and more people trying to get in. Red Cross, they had one Red Cross guy running that whole operation. Why? They had no way to get a hold of people and they were stretched in from all the other shelters that were taking place. <coughs> Uh, it may have been greater after the fact. One of the problems that we had on the second night was we didn't have enough cots for people to sleep on. And so trying to get, you know, what is a priority? Is it urban search and rescue trying to pull people out of homes? Or is it trying to get cots so that people didn't have to sleep on a, on a cement floor? I'm impressed that you had Red Cross and cops by day four. Uh, FEMA, we had a ton of FEMA trucks headed that way because the nice thing with the, uh, I don't want to say the nice thing, but with a hurricane, you could see it coming. We could pre-position equipment. We had warehouses full of this stuff. With an earthquake, no notice. You don't have the luxury of getting those resources into place. So this is the donation file right here. This is the inability to manage information to the public and the public trying to do their own thing. This is unheard of. I mean, and if, I'll show you some pictures. There's humans, like going up a mountain, trying to just add more of these donations to the pile. Everything. I mean, people were donating things like jewelry boxes. I mean, it, it would almost. I mean, people were trying to help, but you know, ultimately, they wanted to be able to give some of some back that you know people knew that they lost everything. Uh, diapers, right? Things for children was a major issue here. It looked all very disciplined. It, it, it really, uh, when I walked into the first door, when I got there, and I saw the, the, the bay, and I walked in, it was overwhelming. The smell, this, the sensory overload, the smell, the amount of people, the it, it was organized chaos, but when you see people in medical beds being attended to, and then right next to that, you've got a, a six-year-old sitting on a cot. I mean, there's some psychological things that those children are picking up. You have the elderly that feel like they're not being attended to. Uh, a lot of issues there. Here's an idea that gives you a further feeding of this. So in order to get those, those individuals fed up on another level, they had all this food and water going. Now, what, what normally happen is these numbers that we're pushing are based on what? We just want to make sure there's enough food and water there. So thankfully, this convention center had enough room to be able to house all this. But some of the convention centers don't have the same luxury to offload out of these trucks. Um, so in the information that's being shared, details like this is huge. We got lucky on this one. Um, where we didn't get lucky was the donations. All those donations had to be reorganized and pushed back out the door to make room for, for survivors. People just donate things for child care. Infants, toddlers, uh, the truth is it's not all the same. And what I did is, I t this is a picture here of a large table of stuff related for uh, infant care and whatnot. And I kept getting these reports Hey, we're on a formula, we're on a formula. No, we're not on a formula. I'm looking at the table. There's 10,000 cases of formula right here. No, we're out of formula. Okay, well, I'm not, I can't find anybody here who's saying that we're out of formula, right? But then I had started asking some questions. What is going on? And it took me a little bit. Just something as simple as this took me well over three hours to figure out. The deal is, is that the people in the shelter were mostly on WIC. And WIC will only pay for one type of formula. And the babies could not eat the formula that was being provided by, whether it was from a local nonprofit, uh, private industry, Walmart was bringing trucks in and just donating stuff. 
there was only a certain type of formula that the babies could consume without regurgitating it. Um, and that's just what it is. And that type of information, it's hard. And then how do you get that in a report? And how do you keep it consistent so that the same information is across the board? This wasn't the only convention center with this problem. And so think about this. Key arena, right? Uh, the football field. Um, uh, you know, what other, what other, other venues that are here that can, people can congregate to in large numbers, we are going to have the same problem, without a doubt. Uh, what kind of law enforcement is pre-positioned or is there, if you're saying, you know, it could get out of hand, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I would say uh, on this, even though the tensions were pretty high, um, people are pretty resilient. I was very impressed, and it kind of gives you a little bit more faith towards, uh, towards our society and humans and how we interact with one another. But I didn't see an escalation in any place that was at least three months where uh, people were aggressive, they wanted or were trying to steal things. You always get the onesie twosie reports, but most people were understandable, uh, understanding or uh, tolerated the inconvenience that they felt at that time. There's just a large number of individuals. The law enforcement presence was awesome. Through uh, the emergency management uh, assistance compact, they had brought uh, um, troopers from other adjoining states in who, there's a third floor on that convention center. That whole floor was medical, uh, medical staff and police officers. A lot, of, a lot of police personnel in the area. That was not an issue. Cascadia, complications of getting roads and getting that type of uh, support in here uh, may be challenging. So with all that going on, right, and this goes back to resources and information, here's one where 13,000 people, we had no way to reunify individuals. This is a lost child that one of the troopers picked up. And I think that each, those are three separate uh, units there um, that, were, that came in on EMAC. But this is a lost child. There was no system in place of how to even communicate within that building, uh, how to share that information. These officers, great, we have the child secure, it's gonna be safe, but how do you actually, now what do you do with that to reunify? Um, this is small scale. Cascadia, no communications, uh, and let's just say, I don't wanna say it's worst case scenario, but all your kids are at school, um, or you're separated from, from the elders. What's the plan there if you can't communicate? We saw this with just something as simple as the Seahawks parade, downtown Seattle, comms went down. Uh, there was people that were friends who had carpooled, could not communicate with where they were at just to get a ride back home. I know, because I was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, for something like that, often you see in shelters, community posting, right? Bulletin boards, so they didn't have anything. With what paper? I mean, people just came in with the the, joke, with the the jackets on their back, right? And um, this convention center didn't offer any services. We just basically took it over and said, or the, the citizens took it over. The governor said, hey, we're going to give this space up. But yeah, there was no paper. There was no cardboard. Um, those type of things just were not available. The pens, who's going to find a pen? Uh, eventually, you know, this gets cleaned up to the point where those systems come in place. But you're talking 13,000 people, and that's just a small population. To I mean, what was impacted in Texas was pretty large. The media, uh, <laughs> this could be a, a plus for you, or it can be a minus. Uh, but these trucks, they rolled in hard, and they were right in the middle of our shelters. They shouldn't have been in the shelters. Um, but there wasn't anybody there to really kind of to, to keep the peace and keep the media where they needed to be. Uh, but that woman at the bottom right, that's a congresswoman who showed up, wanted to show that she was helping out. And uh, the, just the, the media frenzy on something like this, it just drives decision making. Uh, so what they were reporting, saying, hey, look, here's the scenario. There was a times that they were reporting it was much worse than what it was. There's no food and water. We don't see anything. Well, it's because it's on the third floor and the media <laughs> didn't have access to it. So don't report that because you didn't ask the question and you didn't see it. I get it. Uh, but don't make the assumption. Here's that pile I was talking about. Just one donation pile that all had to be removed. Um, these are citizens trying to do good things. Just no direction and bad info. Oh, I think it's No, there's no safety issue there at all. Volunteers, they just kept coming. Uh, when you talk about information sharing, uh, one I think of with the medical folks that showed up, credentialing. 
We, there was no real solid uh, structure in place for credential lane. So if you can you could buy scrubs anywhere, right? You want to show up in an environment like this, and if you wanted to do harm or just be a hero for a day, somebody could figure that out. Um, but this goes into that complex database. How do you manage this type of, of resource? And they are. The medical teams there are resources. The volunteers are resources. The judges. Information sharing and how it worked with the judges. Uh, with disasters, the local communities have to pay for that out of hide in the beginning, right? So if you need emergency actions, there's no magic switch that just says, hey, all of a sudden my bank's accounts are full of FEMA money. That's not what happens. Uh, so here, they had to do it. This is an example in Texas where the judge, the judge is king. With whatever the judge says goes in those communities, and you got his council members there. So the big debate here was about debris. How are we going to move debris? Well, how much debris do we got? Well, I don't know. How much money do we need? I don't know. So you get stuck in this loop because they had bad info, no way to collect it, and now the judge is trying to make a determination on how much money to release and how they're going to do mosquito abatement. $2 million for that. That county did not have $2 million to put towards mosquito spray. When I rolled up to Texas, this is what they gave me. I said, hey, I need a contact list of everybody, right? <laughs> this is what they gave me. Here you go. Uh, the bad news is that this roster is about three years out of date, and all those people you see highlighted there no longer work there, and the phone numbers are out of, out of order. Didn't really do me any good. But I couldn't really communicate with cell phone, right? I didn't have the capability to find out what the right numbers were. So I had to take the time to go door to door to every judge, hey, I need some help. Point me in the right direction. <clears throat> We've got all these fancy web EOC boards and platforms that exist. This is how EOCs were communicating and writing down uh, what their priorities were, where resources uh, needed to be, the objectives. This is what you would see in the field. Uh, and I would say if you compare this to Puerto Rico, this is not as catastrophic in Texas as what was in Puerto Rico. But we didn't have the basic uh, systems in place and equipment in place to be able to overcome this uh, and having to rely on this type of data. Yes, sir. I, I missed the start of it. There was no web EOC. There was no uh, uh, hard communication. I mean, they tend to have that. Yeah, yeah. Well, every every organization, every organization, as you probably know, they pick whatever platform they want, right. right? And so they may be able to have some of them. Some of these counties or jurisdictions did have web EOC or whatever the next platform, Raptor, whatever, whatever that they choose. But it doesn't mean that it's interoperable with the community next to them. Um, and so this is what you have at the county. They're trying to communicate with some of their lower cities. It's all based on licenses, right? So if your county can only pay for or afford five licenses and it's not enough for all your other jurisdictions or cities, it doesn't really do you a lot of good. Um, and the communications were spotty. So this is, this is just a couple of days in after, after Harvey. Still had power outage concerns. Still had issues with telecommunications. This is what they resorted to is doing this type There's of... There's really no excuse for that. I mean, uh, they have a hurricane every year. Uh, they're getting FEMA money through uh, all sorts of different programs. Don't disagree with you, Bob. <laughs> Don't disagree with you one bit. Well, it gets worse. Yeah. Uh, so here's uh, Hurricane Irma. Uh, spent six weeks down here in the middle of Florida. The major areas that were hit, Jacksonville, and then, of course, down in Miami and the, and the Keys. Um, different type of an environment than what we were dealing with and, uh, than what I was dealing with in Texas. Fuel was a problem. Couldn't keep the fuel going. Why? Because Texas was gobbling it up. What had happened? Hurricane came in. Let's send all of our gasoline resources to Texas. All right, well, what about Florida? Well, Florida got handled. It just was a delay. But also, there was no way to tell which gas stations were online and which ones weren't. It just wasn't getting reported. There's no unified way to be able to collect that situational assessment. So do you know what the federal government and the state resorted to? Any guesses? Gas, gas Buddy, an app. <laughs> they could figure out on Gas Buddy that there were certain uh, gas stations that were online and the ones that I guess if there was no, and I don't know how Gas Buddy works, but I guess if there was no entry into there, that there was an update to the gas price that it was soon to be down. So in Sandy, I forget the name of the group, but they're the hacker group, the Common Grounds or Common something something, Pascal Schubach. They, so they, they swooped in and they were able to track where fuel re re 
refills had happened, and they had the whole history of that. And they tout that you know they shared that with all the government. And that's how they knew where the fuel were. Crowdsourcing. Crowds. Yeah. Crowds. So what happened? Did you guys not get any external? I don't know. Up? I don't know. I was in the field. So again, the information might have been flowing up to the Joint Field Office or through the states or through the Department of Energy um, or whatever energy okay. uh, commission that they had within the state. But me on the ground, the local MERS managers, we didn't have that information. We didn't have access to it. We're trying to cobble it together as we're going with no comms and no power. So debris, 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 debris. I mean, it was a, a major issue. Um, what, what, do you, what do you think the differences in debris would be between Texas and Florida? Hats. Hats? <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not, it all depended on the, it was all a result of the hurricane of the impacts to the environment. So in Texas, a lot of water, right? So all the debris was very heavy. In Florida, a lot of wind. I mean, there was some water in spots, a lot of wind, but a lot of it was org organic debris. So if you're a contractor who's on an emergency contract, a national contract to go and pick up debris, where do you think you want to go? <laughs> Texas, because you get a, a greater return per pound for the same debris that might be in Texas because it's heavier than what you were going to get over in Florida, right? But who's communicating that? I, real time, I'm figuring this out. There's no system in place for me to be able to provide this information outside of daily calls. Hey, we got a problem here. Can't get debris contractors. Okay, well now we got stuff that's starting to rot. Uh, survivor lodging. Um, this was actually, it, it took a while to get this worked out correctly, but FEMA's got a process that works like this. If you are displaced from your home, you log on to an app, or you go to a website, or you just happen to bump into a FEMA person who has a tablet and enters in your information, but you register for assistance, saying, hey, I'm living in my car. Hey, I don't have a place to stay. Great. So at that point, lengthy process, poor communications, took days to get this process and the volume of Texas, Florida uh, happening at the same time, you get put into the system. Well, then once you get, you're in a, let's just say you're in the Houston shelter and you get your report back, hey, I'm eligible for 30 days of shelter at, a, at, at one of the approved hotels contracted by the federal government. Awesome. Well, this is what the map looks like. And the uh, problem is it doesn't tell you red, yellow, green, of how full they are. So the same people were calling the same hotels to get registrations into those hotels. There was no availability. Guess what? Those hotels, they like maybe fit, what, 60 to 100 people? So what was happening, these hotels were becoming overwhelmed. They don't even want to pick up the phone. But the other interesting thing is nobody wanted to leave their communities. It's just a psychological thing that I saw repeated, deja vu, in every one of these disasters. I saw it in Sandy. People refuse to leave their homes. I, I don't know if it's a piece related to uh, they feel like they fail or that they've got to sacrifice. It's too much of a sacrifice to leave their homes. But there were toxic conditions where people were living in sewage because the pumps have failed and, and now these sanitation plants, the water has risen and, and then stagnant water and they just refuse to go, right? So here is an idea of this is how information gets shared. Of, but it wasn't useful to the survivors, didn't give you red, yellow, green, show you capacity, um, but also it did not show you every single hotel that was contracted. This was a big problem for us, and I think that they got it under control and they're working this. So we showed you the media trucks. I want to show you this little clip because it's not just the communications that we talk about and information sharing. It is not just about what we push through a computer. Um, this was a big deal at the time down in, in Florida. I don't think I have internet. So basically what the story here is, is that uh, Florida said, hey, by the way, we've got a bunch of, of folks that are going to need American Sign Language. And we need to push out an evacuation notice right now. And they, instead of actually doing any credential checks, trying to look at some type of certifications, they said they had a guy who volunteered, uh, who was hard of hearing, and he said, uh, hey, I'll volunteer to do this for you because you need it, whatever. This guy meant to do really great things. Well, it turns out when he started doing it, uh, there's different, I guess, uh, dialects of uh, American Sign Language. So instead of communicating an evacuation order, he's communicating things like monster, giant cookies, <laughs> like all this gibberish that nobody can understand, right? So they've got the vehicle to deliver the information. Unfortunately, the, the, the delivery is, is what was a hiccup. So I would also say in, in how we do this research and how we find, we've got to have the right information and we've got to get it to the right people in the right formats. Uh, because of the data systems and how we were being able to be alert, uh, alerted in the field, um, I had to uh, just, by chance, 
This was a big deal that came in Florida because power had been out, I think, for six days or so. And down in Miami, there was a notice saying, hey, uh, local nursing home, we've got elderly folks that are starting to perish down there. Uh, but this is, these are the live snaps of me of when those came in. And this was an aha moment. And this goes to show you how one scenario, how one piece of information can drive or change an entire um, disaster and what the priorities are. Now, typically, if you'd see something like this, you'd say, hey, that's a state deal. Right? That's a local community deal, but the state's got to be able to help figure out how it is. Well, at this point, nobody wanted a black eye. Nobody wanted to be put out there saying, hey, FEMA or the state's letting the elderly die in these, in these homes because they don't have air conditioning. So the decision was made, hey, we are going to now have these FEMA teams that are out in the field going door to door to register people. Let's have them start going into these centers, uh, senior centers, and let's do some health and welfare checks. Made a huge ripple across the board. Not everybody was on the same page. Uh, but this was caused a lot of tension out there because it's not FEMA's role to do that. Uh, but this is just boom. Leaders get a piece of information and it came directly from the media. Not a whole lot of uh, uh, verification of what the true scenario on the ground was. Boom, react, go. This is Fort Bend, Florida. This is the best EOC that I've ever seen in my life. And when I say EOC, I mean how this community comes together to coordinate. Uh, one of the great things I loved about it is that they had, for each and every one of the cities within that county, a uh, seat at the table where that emergency manager or that mayor would come in and they would deconflict information every single day. Out of all the EOCs, and I've been in hundreds of, hundreds of them, this was the only operation I saw that really leveraged that and was to break down the stovepipes of information just to do ground control, ground truth, every single day. What is the minimum of that? Fort Bend, okay. Fort Bend, Florida, uh, Fort Bend County, maybe. Uh, so, to me, this is the best case scenario. Fort Bend, they had power, they had communications, and here's some really slick GIS. Uh, there was a platform that they had that showed us the homes that they were able or to already inspect within their county. Green means, hey, they're good. Yellow is some level of impact, and gray, hey, we have no idea what the status is because they're still under four feet of water, but we know people are living there. So this was instrumental to be able to get when I got on the ground there. Problem is, it was hard to keep it updated. Yeah. Think about how many data points there are on that that require somebody to go back and stay on top of in order to, to record that information. Uh, so in some cases, my teams had to make multiple visits out to some of those locations uh, just because the data would look great at first, but there was no management cycle to be able to keep it, uh, like I said, the, the most current. Any questions about uh, Florida? Okay. I, I already mentioned to some that this is really where I felt like I, I was handicapped. Um, I do not speak Spanish. Everybody in Puerto Rico speaks Spanish. Very little English while I was there that I could get folks to, to communicate with me. The problem is, is I wasn't on vacation. Uh, and I was not in my normal role. The people on this island needed something from me and I could not even figure out how to, to come across and to negotiate that. No Google Translate was available, comms was down, rolling blackouts. Uh, this was a major issue for me to try to overcome. We did have some interpreters, but they were few and far between. Hard to get. So I'm more conscious of that now being back here at a Cascadia or a disaster happen. Of It's just, I, I think it comes down to is, is an understanding that there are individuals who have limited English proficiency in our backyard. And I guess for me in Puerto Rico, it would be limited Spanish proficiency. Uh, but, you know, for, for that type of scenario here, we have to really look at that and how we translate data to them. Um, and it's not just the Spanish. We have, you, Seattle's a very diverse area. Portland, that's a major consideration. Those are large population groups. This is a store I rolled into. I have no idea what this says. Uh, you can only buy one case. Thank you. I mean, where were you <laughs> at that time? So what did I do? This was the first store I got to. I, lo I loaded up my cart. I'm like, all right, I need to get some water out. I, for all I know, it says, hey, it's a sale. Buy one, get one free. <laughs> loaded up my cart, got up there. They said, nope, you got to go return the water. <laughs> what do you mean? This was a problem. I needed water uh, in this capacity, and this was a holdup for me. And this is the, 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 it's a translation issue here that we're going to have that when we start collecting information, because there will be... Uh, there will be from these from the from a, a diverse community the diverse communities that we have we're going to have that type of information coming in but how are we going to utilize it if we are in the same circumstance and challenges the speed of data this is a grocery store 
Uh, these, there's a long line, you can't see this. This is a grocery store. Uh, everybody was trying to pay with their credit cards, no cash. Problem is, because of the limited communications, there's only one card reader that could be used out of the entire store. So every time somebody said, hey, I'm ready to, she had to run to each lane to do this because we could not process the information in a timely fashion. And this, is not, this was not the only store like this. Going old school, rolling blackouts, communication outages. Uh, this is for air operations. Uh, we had a couple of stations set up like this. There's no computer magic happening here. It's stickies on a wall. Today, here's the mission, here's the capabilities that we've got. And so if we talk about within NIMS and ICS about trying to build resource typing, what good is it if we have these systems that aren't reliable or we don't have access to when we need them most? Web EOC, here you go, Bob. This is Web EOC out in the field. <laughs> this is, <laughs> yep. This was the most effective way for people to communicate, and it doesn't matter if it was in an EOC, um, doesn't matter if it was just a local fire station, I saw the same thing over and over again. Sticky notes on plotted paper. So the advantages of having information and getting it to the people at the right time. Uh, and I will say that when I was in Puerto Rico, not one time did I see anybody that I suspected of starving, uh, that was thirsty. Uh, there was plenty of resources, right? So a lot of that media, I don't want to say it was hype, but a lot of things you're seeing in the media, I just personally did not see in the field. And so this is an example of a uh, distribution center. Communities can come up, roll into here, and then they get an allotment of food for that day or for the week. Here's some MREs, here's some hot meals, water, all that jazz. Um, it took me about two hours to get into the mountains of where this location is, and the Puerto Rican National Guard did an awesome job making this mission. They were handed it, and then they would also, so if you had a car, you could come get it, but the National Guard would also take it out and deliver it to remote areas. So out on my cruise, I'm getting ready to go meet one of the mayors up in a remote part of the, the uh, mountains. No power. They, they may still not have any power. But I come in, this is bizarre. This, doesn't, this scenario I'm about to show you just does not happen frequently, if ever. So it's basically the, the road's congested, and we pull over, and I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Uh, why are all these people congregated? Customs Border Patrol handing out food. Doing an airdrop. Well, wait a minute. Nobody has authorized or coordinated an airdrop in my territory for the day, right? I'm supposed to be coordinating ops and having visibility of these type of, of uh, maneuvers. Also, the thing that tripped me off is that blue truck. That blue truck is way too close to that unit, right? This is not a prepared, staged deal. This is not something that you would normally see happen out in the field. So I have all these red flags going off. What's, what's going on here? Turns out that it was not a coordinated airdrop. And oh, by the way, that pod that I just showed you was five miles down the road from where they were dropping food and water. So because the lack of information existed of who needed what and when and where, anybody have an idea how much it costs for a helo to do a drop like that for an hour? 25 to 40K on average. They're, they're pretty pricey. Fuel, crew, the ground support teams that you need, all that jazz, 25 to 40K, pretty expensive. It was unnecessary, and we're sending the wrong message to the communities because they think that they're going to continue to get airdrops from FEMA or whoever's delivering this food. They don't care, but they don't have to pay for it. It's free. But at the same time, nobody's communicating to them down the road five miles that there's a pot and they can have all the food that they want. Turns out that those were just good Samaritans that happened to be federal employees working in the area. And at the air base that they were on, this unit, these people all had different assets, and they found through themselves, through communicating, hey, I got a fire truck, hey, I got a helicopter, hey, I got this. Hey, not even 25 feet away from my, my uh, hangar, I've got all this FEMA food that they keep bringing in. So what they would do on their own, somehow they got approval through their chain of command, unrelated to what FEMA was coordinating, they were doing their own airdrops. So this airdrop that they're doing right here was because a local nonprofit said, hey, these people are starving, we need to do airdrops. Turns out the nonprofit was also buddies with the person who was the crew lead on the aircraft, right? <laughs> so all this stuff started to come together, but it took days to go back and figure out why these unauthorized airdrops were happening and who was behind all of that. Not a good data stream to be able to pull this all together. The problem of giving away free food when free food's not needed, the businesses could not get back on, online. So this is an example, and, and there are hundreds of these, 
where the businesses were open. They didn't have power, but they had food, they had water, nobody was buying it. Why? The government, the territory was giving it away for free. But guess what? Now the mayors are upset. We've got to give my people back to business. But the mayors, they want to say, no, I'm not going to sign on the line to stop having those resources come in. Right? Why? Politics. No mayor wants to be the bad person. This is an example up in the mountains all over the place. So even though the power came online around the outer perimeter, uh, I would say pretty fast, within three months, based on the conditions, this is exactly what I saw everywhere that I went. Just down, you know, wood poles, even the concrete poles cracked right in half. They have, and, and they were of a scenario, which I relate back to, we had a great conversation about aftershocks today. They had one earthquake come, or excuse me, one hurricane come through, and they hit pretty hard Puerto Rico. They didn't get to able to repair their infrastructure. Then came the second hurricane and put them down for good. That's no different than, than aftershocks, right? One big quake, hey, it's going to shake things up, break some stuff. Well, those aftershocks are going to take even more infrastructure down. I was amazed. Mass power outage scenario is pretty, is pretty, I don't want to say it's new, uh, new planning for um, our society, but our kids are growing up in a society where the expectation for power is just there. I, there I'm sure some of us have kids or relatives that have never even experienced a power outage of any kind. So, of course, this is hard stuff when you say, hey, I need a situation map of what the power outage scenario looks like. Uh, this took a very long time to get our hands on this. Nobody wanted to share it because of the politics. But also, there's no science to this. Uh, these red and green lines, it's an estimation of where we were pretty sure that the power is still out here, but Army Corps engineers did an amazing job bringing back the system. Basically, they were told, hey, the ball's yours. Uh, the, the Puerto Rican Electrical Power Authority doesn't have the equipment, supplies, contractors to make this happen. Uh, the mayors would have loved this information but we could not get the information to them and connect those dots. And it's important to keep this updated. So those people that were up in the mountains for three months, uh, they didn't have the, the understanding or the perception that, hey, maybe I need to leave the, mountain, re, the mountainous region to go down to the lower valleys uh, because the mayors just they couldn't make those type of decisions. They didn't have the information to them. And I think that human behavior is one of hope. Hey, I hope it's going to come on soon. I hope that power is going to be back on. And here's the Army Corps of Engineers. Again, very few computers and laptops. A lot of all the negotiations that they're doing with Puerto Rico um, and the, the other uh, emergency support functions is all paper-based, right? And as soon as you got that, it's outdated. But at least it was something that people could have and it was reliable. So what do you do? Cell, cell service is down, rolling blackouts if no power at all. Um, the heavy reliance was on satellite equipment. Boy, this was a wake-up call for me. Uh, handheld sat phones, you couldn't understand anything anybody was saying on them. Uh, it wasn't that, that they weren't operational, it's just the speakers were crap and uh, it was hard to talk to. So we all said, all right, these what, 1.3 meter dishes, I think this one's like a 2.5 something. Uh, great, they worked. Very limited bandwidth on these things. You might be able to get five people, tops, on a modern day laptop with the amount of data that's needed. Uh, the bad news is, is that every time it rained, which it rained a lot, I lost service for anywhere from six to eight, eight hours. In the Pacific Northwest, this is no different. I mean, if, this, if Cascadia or some other event happened and we had rain, maybe not as severe as this, but it didn't matter. I mean, it'd sprinkle and those satellite uh, assets would go offline. But this is right out uh, the office window and you could just see that the water would just collect and this happened at least once or twice a day. You talked about the bandwidth gone down for uh Five laptops. Yeah. Was any of it had anything with the satellite? Could the satellite handle more if there were more dishes? I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I'm just an emergency manager, right? I'm I, like I'm not a I'm not a comms guy, so that's the problem. I got this unit that was dropped off by somebody. I don't even know who. I can plug into it five people, but I have no idea what the capability is. Is all I know is that we can't we can't do our jobs. We can't communicate with anybody. But yet the Joint Field Office and the territory is still screaming. I need that report. Where's the report? I got no way to get you the report. I can barely even talk to you on the phone. And there was just a complete disconnect from what the Joint Field Office was expecting and what we could deliver. Here's a picture of the office. Uh, it took many, many weeks for us to get into this. Uh, but lights are off. That one is an emergency light, rolling blackouts. Uh, this stuff, <laughs> it's absolutely complicated. Just when you think that you couldn't handle anymore and you were just getting some progress, boop, lights are off. And this is what we have to be faced with here in the Pacific Northwest 
uh, or it doesn't even have to be the, uh, a Cascadian. I mean, this type of stuff can happen. Uh, the vulnerability to the grid could happen during just the Seattle Fault Red, uh, Portland Hills, whatever. I mean, this is, uh, we're not immune from what we're seeing here. So you probably think that, okay, big mission, all this data is coming in and we're doing really great things with it. We've got all these great reports. This is an example of the report that every day I would collect information and I would compile it. And this is, we're talking in Puerto Rico. I don't know, we're probably at what, two, two and a half months, maybe three months now. But all the data I would provide on, the, on a daily basis, this is all I saw in the field, was this page, branch one. And so you look at it, okay, high risk focus areas, great. The fire alarm, fire suppression system in the branch is out of service. Uh, need effective external affairs. But I don't have anybody calling me, reaching out to me saying, oh, I see you got a problem there. How do we fix that? Uh, generation status, got it, Pot potable water deliveries, meals, water. It's just a graph that's showing what the delivery rates of delivery of commodities has been over a period of time. So I personally couldn't use any of the data that I was seeing being able to collect um, in the field. I wasn't given any special tools to help uh, deal with the chaos. That's what I've got. And then here, here's the number this data would also go into and it'd be collected. How many, how many contacts of people, FEMA, how many contacts did FEMA make with the population at their homes, shelters, whatever? Uh, how many, how many $500 uh, deposits did we provide to survivors that needed instant money? And then, I mean, this is the type of information I was getting. So, you know, is the information different at the local and state level? It's got to be. It's got to be. Um, but I also say at this point, we weren't into a life-saving mission. Life-saving mission, you're going to have completely different priorities for information, right? Where are the people? Where are they trapped? What capabilities do you need to, to be able to solve that situation? and then just build from there. But this is typically, when you start getting deep into an, uh, a disaster, this is the type of information that's being collected, collected to show performance. What type of populations have we met? What kind of money is being doled out uh, to support those survivors? Because uh, those who don't know, FEMA really doesn't own anything, right? We have employees, and we've got a big pocket, uh, a checkbook. But we don't have any fancy trucks. Uh, we've got a couple fancy trucks, I should take that back. Uh, you know, we don't have these airplanes that everybody thinks, or even helicopters, but what we do is, because we have the checkbook, we ask the Coast Guard, hey, we need helicopter support. Uh, we ask the Department of Defense, hey, we need fueling support. All those things we ask other people to do, um, and then at the end of the day, here's the, the, the kind of data that you're looking at. And, and to be fair, this is just a snapshot of some, some books, uh, map books that they provide on a daily basis. But again, I hope that it's driving decision making uh, an effective decision making at the top, and I'm sure it is, but on the ground, this is what I got. It's hard to really do anything with this. So that's pretty much it. That's kind of the flavor. I wanted to just give a little reality to what it is. I've got some stuff that I took out of here, because um, this rabbit hole goes pretty deep. We were talking a little bit about transportation. Power went out uh, in Puerto Rico, and everybody lost their mind when it came to driving. And it's not just the drivers, it's pedestrians trying to cross the road. Um, so these, these normal rules of engagement that you're used to because you have a traffic light are gone and now people, they don't care, they're just trying to push through. Uh, it does have an impact to economy. Economy is a major driver uh, of these disasters, right? Everybody wants to get their people back to work. Businesses want to get back into business. Uh, but the reality is, is that you've got all these complications besides power and fuel uh, and communication. So um, I applaud the work that you guys are trying to do because I do think from an information sharing standpoint, this is important stuff. Uh, we have not figured this out. I would say if you compare to some of the, you know, the, the military agencies that we've got, the 200 plus years old, you got federal agencies that are 50 you know, whatever years old, um, you got FEMA that is, you know, has had multiple uh, shifts in priorities um, since its creation uh, in 79, right? Whether it's civil defense, focusing on hurricanes, and now we're all hazards. But we've got to figure this piece out. Uh, so my, some of my recommendations to here is, I don't know if it's the federal, federal government that does this, but we've got to find a way to be able to build, de develop, build, and show some type of a support of building a platform that is interchangeable, interoperable across all these folks at once. Right now, the biggest limitation is server uh, capacity and access to it, license agreements, this is important stuff. Every, almost every county, community, jurisdiction has an emergency manager now. How do we give them a platform like this that they can use to share information in a way that structures it based on either critical services, whether it's fuel, communications, 
housing, whatever it is that the transportation, we focus it so that people who are looking for that siloed information can go pluck it, pull it. But as of right now, it's just a stream of information that comes in through emails. I very rarely see people have the time to go into Web EOC um, who are decision makers out in the field to go in and utilize that data. Otherwise, you do have people who focus on it. That's their job. They're inputting it. They're collecting it. They're trying to do some analysis to it. Um, but I, don't, I definitely don't have time to sit there at the table or the computer and watch that stuff. So I'll leave it there. Um, yeah, no, thank, thank you, you so appreciate. much. Yeah. Now we have, we have time for questions. Yeah, please. So, so there's a lot of difference between a hurricane and an earthquake. Um, and getting community involved, there's, you don't know if an earthquake's ever going to happen. That's an issue. Hurricanes, you know they're going to happen. Does the FEMA government understand, really, are they tuned in, or are they also going to, well, it'll probably never happen? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, in fact, over the last, let's say, eight years, we took a posture of, of not being in denial, um, but being more proactive. So our current uh, planning posture is, is that we are going to lean forward as heavily as possible. We are doing a better job at trying to determine what threat, th uh, threats and hazards look like. In fact, we're working with Bob um, and his crew to determine what it looks like for volcanoes. We know this stuff is going to happen, but how can we get better informed about it? What does the risk look like? What does the infrastructure and the population impacts look like? And then how do we best lean forward for when that stuff happens? The challenge is that if you look at, and right now our current administrator, Brock Long, um, back at FEMA headquarters, uh, he's got a good message, and that's one is we don't have a culture of preparedness. We do not teach our youth in schools how to be prepared. We talk about geology and, uh, and all this great stuff, but we don't actually say, okay, great, earthquake happens, volcano pops, this is what you should do to protect you and your family. So building that culture is one. Um, two is how do you incentivize some of this stuff, right? Does anybody, you know, I, I, we ask this sometimes to our female employees, how many people are, are prepared and have a kid, this, this, and this? Just because you have a kid doesn't make you mean you're prepared. Right? I consider myself to be prepared. Why? I've got a stock pantry. I've got a generator. I've got 240 gallons of propane. My family's got a plan. There was an active shooter. We all know where we're going to pick our kids up from, and it's not going to be at the school. So those are the type of elements I look at for what preparedness is. It's not necessarily having a kid. Um, but I do think government's all in. They fully understand the risk involved with this. How do we lean forward? Um, and there's some of the things that we're doing right now is, um, is transportation feasibility. So we know resource demands, and that information sharing is huge. How do we get the resources when they need, when they're needed, in the priority order? Example, Alaska. They said the last thing you should ever send us is water. Alaska Shield 2014, what's the first thing we sent them? Water. So those are the things that we got to work out and be able to nail down. Um, but we are. We're spending a lot of time, energy, and money in trying to, to solve those problems. Do we ever really solve them? Probably not. But I think before we see uh, those come to a full uh, potential, is probably another decade or more on some of the topics. Does that answer your question? I, I just want to ask that what Scott said is that uh, you know, FEMA doesn't have one shovel. And so, I mean, if, if, if there's something that has to be removed, the county gets there, or the city gets the front end loader. And then when the state becomes involved, that front end loader is still doing the same thing. The community becomes involved, that front end loader is still doing the same thing. The check just goes someplace else. Yeah. But all of the response is, uh, you know, there's Barbara Brapp's agenda. I mean, she, she does it. FEMA supports Barbara what she's doing. Absolutely. So uh, with the local contracts, with that front-end loader, um, and all the activity happens, they wouldn't even know that FEMA's involved and probably shouldn't know. So, and you said that several different ways. But uh, it all depends upon Barbara. And, and so, Bob, you were an FCO, correct? Yeah. So he was one of the, the top dogs at FEMA uh, back during Katrina, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think maybe this is where I was taking, and, and I don't mean to imply this, but what's FEMA today versus perhaps Katrina, 9-11, or some of those others, right? And you look at Katrina, there's a lot of, uh, in the media, a lot of speculation whether or not FEMA did enough, too little, and all that jazz. Uh, we're not the same FEMA that we were in Katrina. Uh, we've plussed up our staff. Our posture is completely different in being able to, to recognize, hey, we've got to be a part of this mission, but we're a support mechanism, right? So, we'll, And this is some of the challenges we've got with ICS and NIMS is that if you look a lot of that, it's great guidance, but a lot of it, how it's written, can be implied that that's for the first responder on the ground, right? That's for the incident commander handling business, and we're trying to get more of a culture where 
the state and the emergency operations center is one of support, and so is the federal government. You tell us, incident commander on the ground, what you need, it'll keep going up the level until it gets filled. Um, and if it doesn't, we're going to find another capability that's going to fill that need. But you did say two years uh, without power to the uh, that, Pacific Northwest. So that, that, is, a, that is a risk. Uh, the power grid is getting a whole new uh, review right now across the country. Uh, the agency, this was about four years ago, um, there was a, some research done that said, hey, geomagnetic risks, uh, uh, solar storms, is a major risk to, to the U.S. And, of course, not a lot of people have uh, a lot of knowledge on that. So USGS was tasked with look at some of the geology and how does electricity conduct against the infrastructure. But there are scenarios that we saw in 89 in Quebec, um, uh, South Africa, and I think it was early 2000s where the grid went down because of a solar event. You can't, if you can't balance the load on the system, and what happens is though that infrastructure becomes a giant antenna, if you can't keep it in balance, those transformers overheat, they're kaput. So like Bonneville Power Administration, they've got these giant 500 kilovolt, and I don't want to get too, too technical, but they're massive. They're expensive. It takes two year, a year to make, six months to ship, another six months to get it off the ship and get it installed to where it needs to go. Does our population know that? No, they don't. Is it a high risk, low probability deal? Yeah, it is. But, um, you know, there's other factors too, you know, uh, that go into that. Earthquakes, there's a big debate on mitigation. Do you strap down an earth, uh, a transformer that's 850,000 pounds, uh, or you just let it freestand or you put it base isolated? Not a lot of guidance out there right now with those utilities and what to do with those, those pieces of equipment. So how do we help solve that problem? Um, that is, that, those are some of the things that we're looking at working with UW and, and other uh, partners. Regarding getting information out to the public in case of an unplanned and unforeseen event like an earthquake, cascade earthquake, what the plan is a recommendation for jurisdiction, city, county, state. Are they going to rely on um, the existing surviving radio station, or um, do they have a backup enough fuel to operate for X amount of time? Like, how would the public get information on? where to go or where not to go, things that they probably should know. Um, what's the plan or thinking there? Yeah. Uh, I'm so people would have a, a radio and they can't extra batteries, blah, blah, blah. Maybe a no weather radio, but what, what are they going to use them for? So a lot of that, if you look at, there's information out there, there's websites that easily, FEMA's got them through ready.gov, but there's a lot of websites, even the states have them, that says, hey, look, if you want to be prepared, have these in your kits, right? Uh, when you look at the public alert and warning piece of this, um, our country does have infrastructure in place to do public alert and warning, right? So I pause, I don't want to get into too much detail, but the state and those communities have the ability with, you know, a couple of strokes of, of the buttons is to get a message out to their populations, you know, reverse 911, uh, they've got uh, alert and warning sirens if you're out in, along the coast. Uh, but there's definitely needs to be more work here. Uh, in fact, there's a number of uh, scientists here working at UW for a, an early alert warning system, right? There's some, some, there's a beginning of it, but it requires a lot of funding and a lot of resources to get something like that they've got over in Japan. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of advocacy taking place with Congress. Hey, this is some pretty serious stuff. Uh, I was thinking more after the fact, after the uh, oh, yeah, yeah. happened, do, uh, is there enough backup power for the uh, transmitting of <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I will tell you, though, in Puerto Rico, and I, actually I saw this deja vu again in, in many disasters, is that the generators that were in place had never been load tested. So you, you get a brand new building or some infrastructure, you throw a generator out there. Uh, the building that I showed you with the flooding, uh, the generator was actually never even connected to the building. But this was repeated over and over again in, in those three states where generators did not have maintenance, the fuel was not something replaced and refreshed every year. Um, 20 years go by, we've never needed it, didn't pay attention, and they needed it, and it wouldn't come online. So, for an example, I'll give you an example, maybe that's the best thing I can do. It is down in Texas, I just, I, I'm a huge component, uh, proponent of community preparedness. Right, you can have kids, you can have all this stuff, but the truth is, like deja vu that I saw repeatedly, it was these communities coming together, taking care of one another. It wasn't from multiple counties over. It was door to door. Hey, what do you got? Are you okay? You got boats. Do you got this, this, and this? And they would share amongst the community. 
Uh, but so down near Galveston, I'm down there doing an inspection, seeing, hey, have people returned? Is there anybody injured? All that jazz. And uh, I came uh, across this woman who was like, hey, we haven't seen anybody down here for like 10, 12 days. And I said, okay, yeah, hey. And so she was asking who I was with. I said, I was FEMA. She goes, I've got the only running radio station right now in the southern part of Texas, right? And she, like the range, I can't, I could not quote you right now what her range was, but it was a pretty broad distance. So every day she was able to give me her cell phone and every day she did a morning two hour show and I would give her an update about, hey, where we're at, this, this, and this. And she would, I didn't, she didn't even have to hear it from me. She just repeated it. And she was the best thing I had to be able to get word out to the public of what was happening. Hey, you need shelter, you need to register for FEMA, you need to know where the food and water is. Um, whatever it was, I was able, and she had callers that would come in. So when I talked to her in the morning, she would just say, hey, we got a question about this, about debris. You know, where does the debris need to go? On the curb, in the street? I was able to answer those questions. So I think the community concept is one that is going to win uh, at the end of the day. And, you know, there's no promises with any of that infrastructure. But people do need to do a better job with the, the preventive maintenance. Have, have you looked at low power FM in Seattle area? Uh, no, I have not. I mean, no. So we do have a, a, a tactical communications group that we work with. So does the state. Um, but I'm not. I'm not too deeply embedded with the with those folks in what we're doing. I have forgotten to mention one of your credentials, and that is uh, Scott was the uh, master planner behind the Cascadia Rising exercise. This big thing that was mentioned in the beginning. Um, and um, maybe we need more of these exercises, a little more realistic with aftershocks, as we talked right. about. Um, here's the, what we heard in the previous talks, that there is this insight that for uh, incidents of that magnitude, uh, we need to shift from a pull to a push mechanism. Yes. Now, I hear everybody saying that. Now, practically, how, how, what must be changed? I mean, we said uh, for a hurricane, we can pre-stage, we can pre-position. Right. For an earthquake, that's a harder thing. But, but in order to make the push happen, obviously the locals, uh, the state has to do something to make it happen. Yeah, well, I think that the, the push-pull is really comes back to the federal-state uh, coordination piece. That's how we've always had that dialogue. And now how the state and the communities work, they, they're pretty good about saying, hey, look, we know that there's a need here. But if, like a Cascadia, you've got so many counties that are impacted by that, you're going to have to get critical resources to the right people. Now, when you look at the federal system, we have so many resources. you got to be able to prioritize, but we're not waiting for the state governor or the state director, emergency management director, to ask us for food and water. Right. We're not waiting to hear about COTS or for urban search and rescue. We have a plan put together and it, for a 9.0 Cascadia. It says, hey, for a 9.0 and this occurs, we automatically need to do in this sequence, boom, 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 boom. Urban search and rescue, all 50 teams alerted on planes rolling towards Seattle to this air base. Uh, food and water, getting it stockpiled into these warehouses. Uh, power team, we're standing up a task force for power and we're going to bring in the Department of Energy, the energy commissions for each of the state to determine which critical components need to be on first, which community gets power before the next one. Uh, same thing with medical, uh, uh, mortuary affairs, you name it, those teams are all going to have to be driven and we're talking not hundreds of people, we're talking thousands of people. Yeah. And so you can never get back time. Most of those resources are East Coast based. It's at least by the time that you get them activated on planes and into theater could be three to four days. So if, if it waits for the state director or somebody to say, hey, I need urban search and rescue and it's already been four days and now they've just alerted and now it's another four days, by the time they get there, they're not needed anymore because those people are, you know, yeah. So but okay. I'm with you. <laughs> Two last questions. We have to move on. Oh, I was just going to announce that the Seattle Emergency Hubs, which is the community base, we have a drill coming up on April 28. Okay. So I'll give you that information if you want. Sure. It's different than what you guys study because it's the what are the neighbors going to do while they wait for the official response to right. come. But it would be good to. I'm, I'm listening to all these get scenarios to write into it to be able to see and think about. So if this goes on at the local level those first days when you're trying to create prioritized response, how would you take what's available and use it? And could I add a second, your, your second question, sir? Um, so we're doing all these things in the community. How much of your time is spent learning about what's going on in this community to be able to bring the uniqueness uh, information and 
knowledge and ideas to FEMA when this happens versus kind of just getting everything yeah, yeah, yeah. No, from I'm, up top. I'm a huge advocate for the Pacific Northwest because we are unique. Uh, yeah. we're, we're unique from the standpoint of the mountain range and our ability to bring resources in. Um, our population, I think, has different expectations than perhaps what Texas would have. Texas, they were like, hey, we're Texas strong, uh, we're living in sewage, don't mess with us, don't come back, stay off my property, next time I'm going to shoot you, right? Uh, <laughs> I think there's a dynamic of those populations, but those, those uniquenesses that we have, I, I am a huge advocate for. I spend time talking with emergency managers, um, I try doing this, this type of thing, we're interacting with people, and it's not, it's not just me sharing with you, it's stuff that I hear from you guys all the time. Uh, living it day to day. In fact, Hans was explaining to me earlier a little bit about like how their community is set up and some of the works that they do. Um, our agency right now is all about trying to build a culture of preparedness, and uh, that means all things to all people. Well, I want to define that, right? And so sometimes, what are the good practices that we're hearing that's taking place in the community of what that really means? Um, I want to be able to take that, apply it, um, but whether it's me going back to headquarters, working with people like Barb Graff, uh, People, just the local emergency managers, nonprofits is huge. We've got a big planning push that we've got right now focused on at-risk populations. Nobody else in the country is doing this right now. So in the Pacific Northwest, if you look at youth, um, the seniors, limited English proficiency, and, and access and functional needs, we're taking the data, we're looking at that population, and now how do we work with those stakeholders to try to build the capacity there which is very different than what you would expect in the Midwest or in New York City. Um, so yeah, I try to do my best and I try to get out there as much as possible. Okay, that's the last. Well, I have a separate, can you say a little bit yeah. afterwards? Because mine is a news type of question where I'm going, this is a poorly written, not applicable news typing, you're not going to get that opportunity. Bob will take that question then. <laughs> <laughs> I just got it in my inbox yesterday, so. Yeah, I'll do it.